Next on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll discuss how the potential for federal tax reform could benefit farm and ranch families. Plus, we'll have a summer cattle market outlook from the experts at Cattle Facts. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Oxner. Thanks for joining us. One of the serious concerns many farm and ranch families continue to face is a death tax. That's because the tax directly affects family-owned small businesses, such as farms and ranches. And often, it makes it tough to pass on the operation to the next generation. Now, there's hope for progress on repealing the death tax, as the Trump administration is aiming to move forward on a comprehensive federal tax reform. We asked Daniel Beck, NCBA's Director of Government Affairs, about the overall prospects for tax reform and the ways farm and ranch businesses might be affected. This is the, the biggest opportunity we've had in a very long time. The last time Congress implemented fundamental sweeping over, overhauls of the tax code was 31 years ago. Um, the time is ripe for a, a new tax reform piece of legislation, and in that we are fighting first and foremost for repeal of the estate tax. Um, that is our number one priority, but in addition we're also really trying to preserve critical tools in our toolbox like stepped-up basis, cash accounting, and like-kind exchange. Um, luckily, uh, Chairman Brady, who's head of the Ways and Means Committee, is a, a good ally of ours, and he is a, a longtime supporter of federal estate tax repeal. Beck notes that the estate tax, or death tax, as it's often called, puts an undue burden on farm and ranch families and has been a priority issue of concern for NCBA and its members for many years. I'm not really sure what type of individual looks at the death of a person as a, a way to make money, um, but the estate tax is a, a failed federal policy. Death should not be a taxable event, um, and you know, no matter how much I'm communicating that on Capitol Hill, having individuals here who are directly impacted by that, whether it's you know through the loss of a family member and you know having to make some sacrifices in order to keep the ranch in the family, um, or the individuals who have to make sacrifices every single year in order to you know, plan for estate tax purposes. Um, every dollar that's diverted um, from investments in conservation um, or, you know, hiring a, a new ranch hand, that's, that's money out of rural communities that goes towards estate tax planning every year. And, you know, it, those personal stories are really what hits home on Capitol Hill. Of course, before anyone owes a tax, they have to have income. And with that in mind, let's take a look at what the prospects are for profitable cattle markets this summer and fall. Joining us now is Dwayne Lenz with Cattle Facts. Dwayne, as we get started, uh, you know, we've seen lots of pictures of uh, dead cattle due to these fires. Obviously, lots of feed and forage burned up. Uh, is there anything, uh, any kind of impact that'll have on the cattle markets? Well, Kevin, obviously, to start with, it's, it's just a tremendous loss, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's a disaster. You know, now that said, turning to the cattle markets, even though it, it's tough on those folks, in the big scope of things nationwide, not that big of a number. So maybe very regionally, very locally, it could have some impact in numbers with, with tighter supplies, mm -hmm. especially as folks try to replace those cows and what have you. On the, on the bigger scope nationally, it probably won't have a big effect on this one way or the other. Let's talk cattle markets in general. Uh, how are they performing this year as compared to a year ago levels? Well, unfortunately, they're lower. You know, if we look at um, a per head basis, for instance, we find that these calves are bringing about $170 per head less right now than they were a year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, feeder stalker cattle are down about $160. Mm -hmm. Fed cattle down $100. So, you know, the cattle feeder has gained a little bit of leverage. Uh, last year they were losing money. This year they're making a little money. So they were able to gain, take some of that away from cow calf stalkers and start to become profitable again, which should be passed along back down the chain as well. Yeah, and, and, and so what are uh, some of the profitability levels from, from the, some of the feeders here over the last couple of months, do you think? It, it's been pretty good, Kevin. I will tell you, we have a lot of people right now making $150, $200 per head. Gotcha. So we, we're still behind the equity that we lost over the last couple of years, but we're making some inroads. Yeah. Let's talk overall beef demand. I mean, what do you see in terms of overall demand as we get into the summer months and the grilling season? 
Well, you know, demand's been pretty good. It's been a pleasant surprise so far this year. Exports have been up. And of course, when you ship more out of the country, there's less to be consumed on the domestic shelves, and that helps demand. I think had an early spring. Uh, a lot of part of the country got warm there February, March. I, I think they got the grills out. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted beef to put on the grills. It slowed up a little bit here recently, mm -hmm. just with some colder weather. But overall, it's been a pleasant surprise. That's great. And what are some of the concerns that you see on the horizon as we think about uh, putting together marketing strategies for, for our livestock? Well, I think the override, overriding concern is that we're still in expansion. And that means more numbers on the way here over the next two or three years. So as you look at that, it's going to depend on demand. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're going to keep prices at, near, or even above current levels, we're going to have to have strong domestic demand. We're going to have to continue to be able to export product, uh, share it with the rest of the world, uh, get it off ourselves, let those folks buy it, and there's strong demand for U.S. beef around the world. So that's something we think we could do, but we're just going to have to continue dealing with bigger numbers here for a little while. So to that end, I mean, what advice would you give cattle producers as we think about the next six months of the year in terms of our marketing strategies? I, I think we keep selling cattle. You know, when you look at calves, for instance, they're going to work lower into the fall. Mm -hmm. So if a cow calf producer can put something together at a price and profitability level he likes right now, probably nothing wrong with it. Okay. Uh, stalker cattle, you know, they'll gain a little bit into August and they drop back off. So let's look for marketing opportunities over the next 60 days mm -hmm. on stalker cattle. Uh, fed market, we think the trend's lower into summer. We're just going to have a lot of numbers to work through. Uh, so we'll probably have a lower trend going into summer on that end of it. Very good. We really appreciate uh, all you and the rest of the team at Cattle Facts do to Great. keep us apprised of uh, what's happening in our markets. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Want to keep up on all the latest news in the cattle industry? Just visit NCBA's website at beefusa.org. And for more expert analysis on the cattle markets, be sure to visit cattlefacts.com. Up next on Cattleman to Cattleman, we'll take you to Virginia cattle country to meet a man who's found harmony in two very different careers. Plus, we'll show you how the latest technology from New Holland is helping a Missouri operation put up the highest quality hay. Don't go away, we'll be right back. Saddle up and make your way to Denver, Colorado for the 2017 Cattle Industry Summer Business Meeting. This is your chance to stay up to date on beef industry trends and policies, meet with industry leadership and your fellow cattle men and women. Plus, you'll get insights on hot topics at the Issues Forums. Mark your calendar for the 2017 Cattle Industry Summer Business Meeting, July 12th to the 15th in Denver. Find out more at beefusa.org. Out here, we're hostile, cold, and cruel. Our way of life. There's no better way to live. Guts. Glory. Ram. Welcome back. It's not unusual for a farmer or rancher to have an additional job away from the operation, but sometimes you run across an off-the-farm job that is truly unique. Russell Nemitz introduces us to a Virginia cattleman who is following two dreams, raising cattle and creating music. So I always wanted to write songs and I wanted to farm. So I moved to Tennessee and have been lucky, you know, with a career there. And then was always planning on moving back. My dad, my folks still live in the house right there. Uh, and he farmed this until about 80, he was 83. I mean, did it. And uh, then just couldn't really do it anymore. So we moved back here with the idea that I could do what I did from anywhere, right? The businesses are, are not dissimilar in that you're never going to get rich. Uh, you invest all your money back into your businesses and you're more supporting your lifestyle than you are anything. It's a rainy morning in the Shenandoah Valley as Scott Miller gets his chores done. His love for the valley and his farm is obvious and on this morning even the weather can dampen Scott's spirits. 
It is awesome because I put down my fertilizer last week, so I'm looking like a genius. And plus, we've been dry as we can be. This valley, its soil, its grass is an ideal place for cattle and has been. It was the breadbasket of the South in the Civil War, but that was mostly wheat and everything around here was wheat. But as it switched over to cattle, this central location, everybody brought their cattle here. So it's just good grass and good, and good grazing and, and you can do it with low impact and, and a lot of cows per acre. Although Scott is currently dressed for farm chores, Soon he'll shed the coveralls and be on stage performing his music live at the Hamilton in downtown Washington, D.C. His work boots, though, will stay on as he plays. I used to always joke in Nashville, I was like, I'm the only guy down here that has actual cow flop on his boots, you know? And I don't think anybody believed me. I get up here, I'll feed, uh, feed the bulls check everything right now of course we're calving so there's always that to deal with there's always something that's got to be done uh, and I can get out of here probably about 10 30 or whatever uh, get back to the house pack up I can drive up do that show and then be back here early Sunday morning to repeat the process before returning to the farm Scott built a career as a singer and songwriter recording critically acclaimed albums and playing as many as 200 shows a year across the country and even in Europe now he's back home but still writing and playing music he's one man with two full-time jobs that can sometimes be tough to keep in tune I see that all the time in interviews They're like Scott Miller gentleman farmer is like no 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 gentleman farmer get to Somebody else does their work, right? No, this is me doing this. This past summer, we built a, a, some, a lot of cross fencing and I built an alley through the woods behind you there so I can move these cattle from the back pasture and move them up here all by myself. The only problem with that is that nobody can see me do it. It's so awesome. <laughs> but, cause before I'd have to get, you know, call neighbors and get four or five people and it almost was a two day process to get them back through the woods, up here to this and then to get them in. So I built, a number of wings where I can funnel them in and um, two different sorting pens. So it's just a matter of patience. I think sometimes farming by yourself may be akin to like not having a, a limb where you can do everything, but it just takes a lot more effort and twice as long. And like so many other cattlemen these days, Scott is aiming to grow his cattle business. Man, I, I want to expand um, and get a few more cattle. Uh, more income. I've only got 200 acres, so I'm sort of limited. So I'm running a little over 60, and this past summer, now we did the NRCS where we came in, fenced off the woods, and I split some fields where I can graze a little more efficiently. So I'm hoping I can add another 10 or 15. So that's sort of, I'm trying to, still trying to find that balance. During a break from chores, Scott picks up his guitar in front of the bullpen. His music often reflects his love of the farm and the history of his home area. Dear Sarah, I'm stuck on a train bound for Richmond. We march down from Kernstown. You write what you know, and of course it's, it's in me. I mean, uh, I wouldn't say that I focus on it, but you can't help but where you grew up to have it affect you. And especially here, I mean, if you look, you can see the surroundings and the people here. And although the audience on the farm is not at all like the one that'll fill the room he'll perform in later, he appreciates these fans for the value they bring to his herd. They ran away, didn't they? Well, I think it's the best way to make my herd better and the most money efficient way is by upgrading the kind of the quality of bulls. I mean, that's the easiest way. And that's just the most efficient way for me to do is to take my best heifers and keep them and, and breed up. Cavies is important to me only because if I've got to be gone, I can't, sometimes I can't be here. So I need something that I can turn my back on and know they'll be all right. There's no doubt life on the farm is a whole lot different than playing music on the road. But finding the harmony between these different worlds is something Scott Miller is committed to doing. Well, you know, I mean, farming's a challenge and you gotta love it or you don't need to be doing it. And this was always where I wanted to be and always what I wanted to come back and do. From the scenic Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, I'm Russell Nimitz for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. 
Now, if you'd like to learn more about Virginia cattleman Scott Miller and hear more of his music, you can visit his website, thescottmiller.com. Still to come on Cattleman to Cattleman, we'll show you how advancements in technology are helping farmers and ranchers put up higher quality hay. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay Tough Fence will last three times longer and is four times stronger than low tensile fencing. High tensile wire, solid vertical stays, and tight fixed knots all provide superior strength. You will use fewer posts, saving time, labor, and money. Protect your investment for generations with Stay Tough Fence. Stay strong, stay tight, stay tough. Have you discovered self-deworming cattle products? All the benefits of an effective deworming without all the labor, handling, and stress. Discover Safeguard self-deworming cattle products. Ask your local animal health provider or visit safeguardcattle.com for more information. Welcome back. The equipment that farmers and ranchers use to put up hay has come a long way and is assisting operations in becoming more productive while still making a quality product. Cattleman and Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter takes us to Floyd Farms in Missouri to learn more about the IntelliBale Round Baler. In southwest Missouri, Steve and Gavin Floyd run cows, background calves, and work hard to put up high quality hay. Annually we cut a thousand acres of hay. We do alfalfa and we do a lot of uh, fescue orchard grass and clover hay. Out of the 3,500 to 4,000 bales that we make each year, we feed uh, some of them and we sell hay also. Because we sell some hay, not only uh, our customers expect good quality, but we need good quality for our own hay that we feed our calves with because that's what makes calves gain weight. One of the ways the Floyd see an opportunity to improve efficiency is with a New Holland round baler that includes a feature called IntelliBale. So IntelliBale basically is the ISOBUS 3 uh, level of automation between a round baler and a tractor. And the tractor can be CVT, continuously variable transmission, called auto command, or it can be a power shift. Um, and what it does is basically the round baler is going to take control when you give it control um, of the remotes of the tractor and also the transmission. So what happens is, is I, I bail, I'm just focusing on steering. I don't have to stroke a remote whenever the bale is, is wrapped and ready to dump and I don't have to close the tailgate. The baler is going to do all that for you. It also does a couple other things. If you're on hills, um, it'll actually break the tractor transmission, hold you in place and let you dump the bale. Um, which brings up another point. Let's say you're going up a hill and you're about ready to turn loose of one of these round bales and you don't want it to end up in the neighbor's pond or the neighbor's house. Uh, you can customize functionality of ISO 3 and allow a manual wrap cycle should you choose to do that or maybe you want to be uh, on manual dump or, or uh, manual release of the bale for this type of situation that's going to give you a chance to back up 90 degrees to the hill, drop the bale, and then take off again. So there's some customization that you can do with ISO 3. Using a new baler uh, with IntelliBale would, would uh, definitely make us uh, more efficient and we could get done, um, we could get done faster. Um, with the capacity of the baler plus the uh, IntelliBale stopping the tractor and opening the tailgates, um, it would improve efficiency greatly. In fact, the IntelliBale round baler has a variety of features that will help producers more easily get more hay out of their field. The Roll Belt round baler has 20% more capacity than it ever has before, with the largest pickup in the industry at 82 inches from tine to tine. So you've got the most efficient pickup there is in the industry. Now how do you go to the next level? Well, IntelliBale is the next level. Automated features where the implement tells the tractor how to operate efficiently is the next step in efficiency. You know, as a New Holland dealer, I'm really excited about uh, New Holland's new series of balers. 
Uh, the new pickups that we have on these balers are second to none in starting a bale and capacity. The feedback we get from our customers, um, th these balers will really get out there and bail. Uh, you've got a lot of capacity. At Floyd Farms, Steve does spend long hours baling hay, so automating some of the baler functions will help reduce fatigue. Definitely take some of the fatigue away uh, by using the Intella bale. Plus, it's, uh, you probably bale a little faster because it's all automatic when it opens the tailgate and closes the tailgate. It, uh, it does it probably faster than you can when you're doing it by hand because sometimes I'll wait a few seconds before I shove it forward to shut the tailgate or something. So some of the options the operator has when ejecting the bale, depending on if you're in flat fields like we are today, you can just basically put everything on automated and operate. Let's say you're in more challenging conditions with rolling terrain. There you may want to choose to actually put the baler on what we call manual dump. Uh, if you do that, then basically it's going to go ahead and automatically stop the tractor transmission when you hit full bale, wrap the bale, and then buzz at you to say, hey, it's time to dump it. That gives you a chance to basically clutch, put the transmission in gear, back up 90 degrees to the hill, drop the bale, pull back into the windrow, push the automated button on the front of the CVT shifter and away you go back in ISOBUS 3 mode again. Of course, another priority when making hay is ensuring no feed is wasted or ruined. So some other benefits of IntelliBale would be an example such as this. I'm a little lazy on the clutch, so what happens is this crop still keeps coming into the round baler pickup as we're net wrapping. So net gets embedded in the outside ed edges of the bale. And so, hey, today that doesn't seem like a big deal, but let's fast forward six months. Snow's flying around and I'm feeding cattle. Well, now the net's frozen in that outside edge of the bale. Now it costs me money because I can't rip that frozen feed off the net. I gotta ball that feed up with the net and burn the net basically or get rid of the net. So I'm losing feed. And Telebale could have saved you that feed by putting it in an automated mode and then basically the baler will not feed crop in until the tractor comes to a stop and then the wrapper starts. So it guarantees that feed's not embedded in that outside edge of net. Beyond the high-tech capabilities of the baler, the Floyds also value the fact that they can turn to their local New Holland dealer as a dependable source of knowledge and help. s &H Farm Supply is our uh, New Holland dealer. They have been great to work with. Uh, when we have had a problem, um, they've sent their mechanics out um, the same day. For, for us, as being a hay and forage expert, it's all pieces of the puzzle, from the equipment to the servicing to the parts. And we feel as, as a New, New Holland dealer, we offer a wide range of tractors and hay equipment and other complementing equipment. Um, but most importantly, as being a full line dealer, it's about supporting the product and having the parts on the shelf so when the customer comes in, we can get them going. We are always challenged to stay up to date with the, the latest equipment and, and those changes come at us more rapidly than ever today. And so we spend a lot of time both in the field, uh, online, doing online training and doing hands-on training with the manufacturers to try to, to uh, maintain par just to try to stay up to speed and and I think the best training for us is to actually get in the field, run the equipment, spend time with customers who have it and, and really see what makes it click. Reporting from Southwest Missouri, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. To learn more about the IntelliBale Round Baler, you can visit the New Holland website. That's newholland.com. Still to come on Cattleman to Cattleman, we'll tell you about a research project that could give producers the power to select cattle that are resistant to BRD. Don't go away, we'll be right back. There is a new world out there, revealing itself in unpredictable ways. A world that demands more from the land and those who grow, farm, and build on it. This new world calls for the ingenuity to get more out of it while preserving as much as we can. After all, to stay ahead of tomorrow, we need to be equipped for it today. New Holland, equipped for a new world. What does it mean to be dependable? It means you do what you say you'll do time and time again. Because performance isn't optional and your task is essential. 
For over 95 years, we have proven ourselves to be the most dependable choice. That's why the cattlemen of this great nation trust Ritchie to provide fresh water on demand. Ritchie, proud to be a partner to the American cattlemen since 1921. You're watching NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen on RFD-TV. Welcome back. Bovine respiratory disease continues to be one of the biggest issues we face, costing the industry more than a billion dollars annually. But a group of researchers is hoping to battle BRD with genomics. Cattlemen to Cattlemen reporter Brad Bulla takes us to Idaho for an update on the BRD cap and how the efforts of researchers and industry working together could provide new weapons in the battle against BRD. At Simplot Land and Livestock's feeding operation in Grandview, Idaho, cattle receive top quality health care and attention as they're finished. Even so, Simplot's Dr. Randall Raymond says the crew here has to be on guard every day to prevent BRD. Bovine respiratory disease is one of the biggest challenges we deal with, and depending on the class of cattle we're talking about, it can be, it can be one of the most significant things that we see in the feed yard in, in terms of health and performance outcomes. So there are a lot of costs associated with respiratory diseases in the feed yard. The first is the, the cost of the actual medication and treatment. The second is, is labor, the time it takes to remove cattle from the pen, get them to a hospital facility, treat them, and help them recover and then get them back to their home pen. So reducing labor costs and medical item cost is a, is a big deal. The, the real hidden costs are, are in the production loss that we see and they're sometimes hard to measure. The economic cost of BRD in the cattle industry is enormous. We've uh, conservatively estimated that based on the incidence rates that's reported across the industry that the losses exceed $1 billion just to the feedlot industry alone. And those losses uh, stretch back. There's also losses in the stalker industry as well as the cow-calf industry. With the economic impact of BRD touching all producers in the beef supply chain, researchers working together in the USDA-funded BRD CAP project have focused on the use of genomics to tackle this costly disease. As an economist, one of the things that I'm really interested in is looking at production efficiency trying to identify ways and new tools and new technology that will uh, identify ways to improve production efficiency. And given the large economic cost of BRD, it's really uh, a critical need to the industry to find new tools and techniques to reduce the losses associated with it. So the BRD cap is taking an innovative approach by really focusing on the opportunities to use genetic selection to improve the performance of cattle, reduce the susceptibility of cattle to get BRD, and with that improved uh, production efficiency, it'll reduce the cost, reduce the disease incidence. So what really excites me about using genomic tools to help select for animal that would be less susceptible to BRD is that there are a lot of cattle that we deal with that everything seems to be, have been done right. They're well vaccinated, they come from operations that are well managed, they are not stressed when they come, the truck ride's not too terribly long, we get them on good feed, and they still have very significant respiratory disease outbreaks. So if we could have one more tool to identify ways to help those cattle be less susceptible, that would be fantastic. And genetics certainly play a big role in that. They play a big role in growth, they play a big role in carcass quality, they certainly could play a big role in, our, in disease resistance. By eliminating BRD uh, to a great extent, the industry would uh, gain the efficiencies and probably most importantly, reduce antibiotic uses. And as those antibiotic use decreases, that has improved market acceptability and improved animal welfare. And so those gains would be dramatic. A selection tool that would help reduce the incidence of an economic pitfall like BRD could serve as a way for producers to contain costs and avoid loss production efficiency. Achieving that would be a benefit no matter what's happening with cattle market prices. The cost of BRD is as I see it is independent of the market cycles. The value at risk in an upmarket is certainly higher. 
But in a downward trending market, you still have those production efficiency losses. Your margins are, are more challenged, uh, harder to reach, maintain profitability. So any loss, any disease loss, any loss in production efficiency, that's going to be uh, equally important in downward markets as, as you try to maintain profitability. The beef industry has done a really nice job over the last 20 or 30 years of increasing their production output with less inputs. And as we find animals that don't ever get challenged with respiratory disease, we can continue to become more and more efficient. And as we are challenged with providing protein to the world and to feed people's families, that's, that's really important as we try and reduce all the other resources that are involved in producing a beef animal. Selecting for animals that are less prone to BRD is only one of the genetic tools available to produce healthy animals. Crossbreeding has also been shown to reduce disease incidence. So one of the things that we can't forget about is the value of crossbreeding and what heterosis brings to the table in terms of hybrid vigor, productivity, and health. So as we, as we talk about genomic selection, you know, I think that's, that's one of the things that we we need to keep in mind is that crossbreeding is relatively easy to do and as we select for sire lines or other things that help us with disease resistance that uh, crossbreeding is probably the first step. As the five-year BRD CAP project reaches its completion, scientists from several land-grant universities and the USDA Agricultural Research Service hope that the selection tools and additional outcomes of the project will ultimately help producers select for animals that are less susceptible to respiratory disease. A number of industry collaborators were also essential in providing the field data to help address this critical disease challenge. Managing selected animals in a way that minimizes their risk will enable a sustained decrease in bovine respiratory disease and antibiotic treatments. Ultimately, this will improve animal health and welfare and the overall economics of the beef cattle industry. And that's why this study is so exciting because those rate of genetic gains are cumulative and they occur annually and they're cumulative over time. And so they'll whittle down that billion dollar loss. From Idaho, I'm Brad Buller reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. The BRD coordinated agriculture project is continuing and the group meets regularly to review and report on its progress. If you'd like to find out more, just visit the website brdcomplex.org. Still to come, we'll check in with Baxter Black. And next, we head to Texas for expert insights on effective tools in battling against mesquite. Stay with us. Do you know all you need to about working cattle? Did you know there are proven methods that can reduce stress for the animals, for you, and for your crew? Learn from the experts who can help sharpen your stockmanship and stewardship skills. By attending a stockmanship and stewardship event, you'll learn proven ways to work cattle more efficiently, skills that can help put more money in your pocket. Find out more and locate a training session near you at the website stockmanshipandstewardship.org. Want more profit out of your pasture? Then here's our two cents on using parasite control to make some dollars. In a trial of calves, long range outperformed Cydectin and Safeguard dewormers combined by as much as an extra 40 pounds. Yeah, that's a lot of extra profit. And that's why it pays to treat cattle with long range. Do not treat within 48 days of slaughter. Not for use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older, including dry dairy cows or in veal calves. Post-injection site damage can occur. These reactions have disappeared without treatment. You can't afford another season without long range. Welcome back to Cattlemen to Cattlemen. One of the keys to success for cow-calf producers is providing adequate grass and forage for their cattle. But that job gets especially tough when weeds and invasive species such as mesquite are in the picture. Cattlemen to Cattlemen reporter Candace Weida has insight on ways to win the battle against mesquite. For cattle operations here and in much of the Southwest, one of the biggest barriers to improved grazing and wildlife habitat is mesquite. We came to Texas to gain some insights from industry experts and producers who are experienced in battling mesquite. Mesquite uh, robs moisture that uh, we can sure use on our, on our rangelands. 
Mesquite is a very prolific plant down in the southwest. Um, Texas, it, it, it really is a big problem for us, probably our biggest noxious plant problem. Mesquite is a uh, real concern to us because it's, uh, it's an invasive species, it's very prolific. Canopy cover causes us problems. It, it uh, shades out our natural grasses and thus reducing our forage growth less grazing ability. The problem is is that it comes in and basically makes a monoculture. Shades out a lot of our native grasses. Um, not only causes a monoculture from a brush standpoint, but also from a, a forage diversity standpoint. Only certain types of plants can actually grow under a mesquite canopy. And so you can actually change a pasture quite dramatically just in the diversity of the forage plants with a mesquite uh, canopy coverage. Why is mesquite so difficult to control? Mesquite is very hard to control mainly because it's such a prolific re-sprouter from the crown of that plant, the base of that plant. We can actually go in and top kill mesquite by cutting it off, mowing it, shredding it, um, fire or anything else and not kill that plant. Uh, it will re-sprout from the base so that the, the target when we're talking about killing mesquite is actually killing what's below ground and not what's above ground. With mesquite, we, it was a uh, management program was developed over, out of necessity. Uh, it was, we were losing so many, so many acreage to mesquite. Uh, our hand was forced. Uh, we had to come up with something. Uh, Sendero was our best avenue. Tell us about your experience with Sendero here on the operation. Our experience with Sendero uh, has been very good. Uh, we've, we've been very happy with the results we've, we've received uh, using Sendero on our mesquite. We've been able to reduce our, our uh, mesquite population, our canopy cover significantly. Sendero in conjunction with other management tools have really helped us. We, you know, incorporate that diversity and increase the diversity across the ranch. We started a mesquite research project back in about 2007 and over about a seven year period we came up with Sendero herbicide and our goal with that project was to not only improve the mortality of, of mesquite control that we get from, from a herbicide but also the consistency of that. What are some of the different ways that Sendero can be applied? Sendero can be applied in, in a multitude of ways. Um, mainly, we, we put it out with an airplane as an aerial application uh, in a low volume type situation. We'll do what we call individual plant treatment, uh, backpack type sprayers or uh, UTV or ATV type sprayers where we spray individual plants. Uh, we can spray the foliage uh, with Sendero and, and, and do a very good job with a little wider window of application. Why is timing so critical in the application of Sendero? With mesquite control, probably the number one thing that we really need to look at is proper timing. Um, and there's several factors that we want to look at. Um, we want to look at the time of year that we actually start spraying. Uh, and essentially what we want to see is, is we kind of start counting back after bud break. And we want uh, full leaf development and we want dark green leaves. Once we get those dark green leaves, then that we know that at that point it's a fully developed leaf and we're actually moving carbohydrates down into that root system. We talked about wanting to kill that root system. So we have to, we have, to have the carbohydrates moving down in that plant and going to the root system. So the timing to do that is very critical. What are the advantages of having selectivity in mesquite management? Through the research project for Sendero, uh, one of the things that we began to notice is, is how selective it was to, to mesquite. And we started noticing how it was leaving some of the more desirable species unharmed, such as our oaks, such as our bromelias, such as our lope bushes and things like that that are important wildlife species. The selectivity of Sendero herbicide is really an important part of it today mainly because of the fact that landowners are beginning to utilize their land more from a wildlife standpoint uh, compared to, to cattle. Now there's still obviously lots of cattle producers out there, but, but a lot of those cattle producers also have a benefit from their wildlife populations in terms of economic income and things like that. Using Sendero, the selectivity of it 
actually gives us the benefit of leaving some of our desirable species. Those desirable species are important for wildlife habitat. Being able to decrease the mesquite and increase the diversity of, of the desirable browse and forbs has uh, given us the ability to increase the, uh, the quality and quantity of our deer herd. Uh, our bobwhite quail population has been gaining ground, uh, whereas most place, other places there's an opposite trend from that. The unchecked invasion of mesquite can cut forage production by 60 to 70 percent. Dr. Jim Ansley with Texas A&M has been researching new ways to win the battle against mesquite. People have traditionally done brush sculpting with mechanical treatments where you take a bulldozer out there and or some other big piece of heavy equipment and clear lanes, uh, either uprooting plants or knocking them over and that obviously is very exact. You can do that exactly where you want to, but the problem with that is typically, unless you're pulling the plant out by the root system, you typically get the re-sprouting that occurs, and so all of that investment, maybe sometimes $300, $400 an acre, all of that investment goes by the wayside uh, in five, 10 years because of the re-sprouting, and, and then you're looking at a, at a re-sprouting forest of mesquite that's even worse than you had it before. Sendero can do that for a much cheaper cost and the other nice thing about it is that you've root killed most of those mesquite in there and so they're not going to re-sprout and so the, the longevity of keeping that area open is much, much longer, you know, 30, 40 years. How does Sendero bring value to cattle producers who are looking to control mesquite for grazing purposes as well as for wildlife? So it is, it's really more of a, of a, of a difference in in what you want to do in, in different spaces on that landscape. Uh, Sendero is, as a product, it's very good about not drifting, and so it, it, you can be very exacting as to where you want to uh, spray Sendero. So if you want to have a 30-acre area of, of open land that is currently infested by mesquite, but you would like to convert that more to an open grassland, uh, or maybe a grassland that has some of the better shrubs in it for forage value, uh, Sendero can be used for that, but you may want an area right next to that that you still want to keep as, as a dense patch of mesquite or some other brush species for wildlife habitat. So the nice thing about a product like Sendero is that it allows you to do that. You can, you can, you can do that brush sculpting in a very exact manner. So if a producer is looking to restore their pasture for the purpose of grazing as well as wildlife, where should they start? The first place to start would be to really try to get a good inventory of how that brush is distributed on, on that area. You usually have quite a bit of variation in that brush density. And what I would recommend is that typically in the areas that have the most dense mesquite, that's where you're gonna have the least grass production and probably the most, the most deterioration of your grass community in my opinion, that's not the best place to start. I would work on, I mean, if, you, if resources are limited and you realize that you can't spray the entire pasture, you don't have the resources to spray the entire pasture, and you may want to have a little bit of wildlife habitat in addition, if that's one of your goals. I would work on the areas that are maybe a little bit less dense, that still have a pretty good grass community, that you can get a, be a better bang for your buck, uh, when you spray that immediately because that grass community will respond faster. There's no doubt left untreated, mesquite will take over a pasture and leave little or no grazing for cattle or habitat for wildlife. That's why new tools in the effort to manage and control mesquite are so eagerly welcomed by producers. In Texas, I'm Candace Wieda reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. For more information on mesquite control and Sendero herbicide, call toll-free 888-346-6910. By calling, you can sign up to receive this informational brochure on Sendero herbicide and more. Again, just call us at 888-346-6910. When we return, we'll check in with Baxter Black. Don't go away, we'll be right back. 
Say goodbye to your toughest pasture and rangeland weeds for good. Because one product offers season-long control, handles the widest spectrum of broadleaf weeds, and clears the way for increased forage with greater grazing flexibility. So you get more beef per acre at a cost that can't be beat. It's Grazon Next HL Herbicide. And if it's in your pastures, plain and simple, weeds won't be. When a new calf hits the ground, his clock starts ticking. A belly full of colostrum gives him his best odds, but if he doesn't get any, his time starts running out. That's when you grab a bag of Oxford Ag Colostrum in their patented feeding system. Fill them with warm water, shake it to mix, feed it with a tube or nipple, and you are done. No bucket, no bottle, no mess, and right on time. Get yours at OxfordAg.com. Cost less than a dead calf. Did you know that Prefert makes over a thousand different farm, ranch, and rodeo items? And now, thanks to Prefert Direct, it's easier than ever before to get access to every item Prefert makes delivered direct to your local dealer. For more information about Prefert Direct, visit us at prefert.com. Prefert, America's number one name in farm, ranch, and rodeo. cow can make me so mad my skin gets hot to the touch. But I get a heap madder, I'll tell you, when I have a slipping clutch. There's something about mechanical things that's worse than an nagging wife. They acquire some kind of a annoying twitch and then seem to come to life. The dead gum release on handyman jacks. A bolt that never quite fits. Phillips screwdrivers with heads more plumb out give me the shiver and fits. Or a comfortable cab that leaks like a sieve, sprockets that won't hold a chain, and trying to change your tire in your suit going to church in the rain. I'd lots rather really put in a prolapse, or handle a biting dog as work on a baler that ain't tying right, or augers that just won't aug, or them motors that's all time a dying. Them sprayers that drizzle and drip. Electrical breakers that sizzle and crack and clippers that rather not clip. <coughs> I'm plumb sick and tired of fighting them things made out of plastic and steel. There's days I believe I'd strangle that man, the one that invented the wheel. As you might have guessed by hearing me talk for sure, I'm no fix-it man. And there ain't no walking disasters that's worse than me with a wrench in my hand. I could trade places with Adam of old and still never get relief. My wife, good old Eve, would need something fixed. She'd probably have a loose leaf. This is Baxter Black from out there under here. Thanks, Baxter. I can sure relate to all those mechanical issues you were talking about. We'll have more Cattlemen to Cattlemen right after this. Stay with us. No matter what job I've got to do, my John Deere 5E tractor can do it all. Whether I'm cutting, moving feed, or building a fence. Using my 5E means my work gets done faster at a price I can afford, and that works for me. Blaze a trail to Phoenix, Arizona, and the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. It's the cattle industry's biggest convention with education, networking, and fun. Plus, you can check out the huge NCBA Trade Show, outstanding entertainment, and more. 
Don't miss the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show in Phoenix, January 31st through February 2nd. Visit BeefUSA.org for more. Welcome back. It's time once again for Legacy Photos. Let's check out some great shots from farms and ranches all around our country. Want to see your photo on Cattleman to Cattleman? You can submit your favorite shots at our website, cattleman cattleman.org. Well, that's our time for this week's edition of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. We leave you with a bit more music from Virginia cattleman Scott Miller. We'll see you again next week right here on RFD TV. How am I gonna ever be me? How am I gonna ever be me, Lord? How am I gonna ever be me if I'm not who I'm supposed to be? A mother's son, a father's boy, a brother's friend, a sister's joy, a cousin true, an uncle cool, and who knows, a father too. A shy recluse who once shut in, a patriot, a citizen. Why was I born a mystery? How am I ever gonna be me? <laughs>